dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed, it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers them with the pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your corpse is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of the wilderness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. The word of the Lord. Amen. Please stand with me as you are able as we hear these words of Jesus. Reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder. Whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, where your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. And you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right hand causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. And it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, these past few weeks, we've uh, been in this series where we are considering the soul, considering what the needs of the soul are, considering the nature of 
your soul and, and my soul. And by the way, if you're reading the book uh, with us, uh, this week we're moving into chapters uh, 6, 7, and 8. So that's where we're at in, in the book. So if you haven't picked one up, you're not that far behind us. We'll catch up, catch up easily. We're, we're slow readers around here at, at Grace. So we, we're considering the, the soul, and of course, the soul, your soul, is the most important part of you. Your soul is the deepest part of you, and that's why we're taking time to consider the soul in these weeks of, of Lent. And one of your soul's greatest enemies is known as the enemy of sin. And so that is our consideration today. Scripture says... There are sinful desires inside of you, and they are waging war against your soul. So it is this sin that is actually coming to wage war against the deepest and the most important thing that is about you, and that is your soul. Now your soul, and we've been looking at this, is what integrates, it's what connects, it's what binds together your will. Those are your choices. And sometimes the word spirit or heart is used for will. And then it binds together your mind, all those thoughts and feelings and desires going on all the time inside of you. And then also binding together your body, which has all of its appetites and all of its habits and all of its behaviors. Some good and some bad. So God designed you so your choices, your thoughts and your desires and your behavior would be in perfect harmony with each other and would be powered by this unbroken connection with God in all the things that God has created, including the people that live around you, in your families and, and in your community. You see, you were made to have this unbroken connection of the soul. But you see, sin is waging war on your soul. Sin creates trouble for the soul. Sin is that thing that we do despite our best efforts and our vows to stop. And so when I think about sin, it is very hard for me not to think about chocolate chip cookies. That's just where my mind goes. Chocolate chip cookies. I have a love affair with chocolate chip cookies. Now, some people accuse me already as shamelessly maybe putting this out to the congregation uh, just in order to get some chocolate chip cookies this week. But would I ever do such a I am a sinner. Yes, I would. I would do that in a heartbeat. But I love chocolate chip cookies. And you know what I love even more than chocolate chip cookies is chocolate chip cookie dough. Have you ever tasted chocolate chip cookie dough? I mean, it's, it, that's like heaven, right? I mean, that, that is heaven right there. I probably ingested more chocolate chip cookie dough than I ingested any other type of food. Uh, and I have... Really, I have wonderful memories of chocolate chip cookies and chocolate chip cookie dough. And then, you know, um, I say to myself, um, this has got to be my last scoop of chocolate chip cookie dough, or this has to be my last cookie from the coolie rack, because my stomach is starting to ache. And uh, so I walk out of the kitchen, and it's not long, I find myself right back into the kitchen with my hand in the cookie dough bowl, or my hand reaching for a chocolate chip cookie from the cooling rack. I say to myself, okay, this is going to be the last one. This is going to be the last one, and then guess what? There's always one more. And then one after that, and then one after that, and then one after that. Now on the whole, there is not a lot of damage that comes with this type of love affair, a love affair with, with chocolate chip cookies. But still to use them as kind of a mood-altering drug probably isn't the best thing. So, normally, we would describe sin, this thing that, remember, is 
that is waging war against our soul. Normally we would describe sin as that anything that separates us from each other. It's anything that separates us from the love of God and from each other. It's anything that separates us from being in relationship with God or harms our relationship with God or harms our relationship that we have with our neighbor, with one another. And I'm not sure chocolate chip cookies would be classified in this category, but I suppose when Emily's making cookies for an event and every time I walk into the kitchen and I grab some chocolate chip cookie dough or I grab another cookie that's cooling on the cooling shelf uh, where Emily is probably making these cookies for someone other than myself, that doesn't do anything to strengthen my relationship that I have with her. It hurts the relationship that I have with her. So much as I hate to admit it, of course, you know this chocolate chip cookies is not my worst sin. My sins go much deeper and broader than chocolate chip cookies. And I suspect that yours do too. I just talk about chocolate chip cookies to begin the conversation. To have us think about sin and how this sin is actually waging war on our souls. I have much deeper sins than chocolate chip cookies. I imagine that you do too. You know what your chocolate chip cookies are in your life. And they're waging a war on your soul. Sin as the human dilemma is that thing that invades the soul and wages war on the soul. Sin is the thing that in many ways defines what it is for humans even to have a soul. Well, when we think about animals, we don't necessarily think about animals having a soul. We don't necessarily think about animals sinning, right? I mean, when we think about our animals or our pets, like our dogs, we just think about them having bad behaviors. We don't necessarily classify our animals as being a species that sins. Though you might make the argument that cats indeed do sin. I, I believe that cats do sin, but not mostly not other animals. <laughs> so for you cat lovers, uh, I don't know if you're going to think about that. I'll get myself into trouble here. But we never talk about animals sinning, sinning. We talk about their naughty behaviors, right? In order to be able to sin, we need to be capable of knowing the difference between the things that are life-giving and those things that are death-dealing. So spiritually speaking, animals don't sin, maybe cats do, but most animals do not sin. The name of our species says it all, right? Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, you know what that means in Latin? It means wise men or wise people. It means a knowing person. A knowing person. So we know the difference. And so that's what makes us capable of sinning. It's because we are homo sapiens. We know the difference. You know the difference. And I know the difference. And Lutherans have always been interested in sin. In fact, we've always had a real keen interest in sin. And it is so without fail for each worship service we always include, and maybe you've noticed this throughout the years, we always include what? A statement about our sin in our worship services. We have a confession of sin that we pray together as a community of faith, lifting that sin up and asking God to take that sin on, to actually forgive us of that sin because we are knowing of our sin. We are homo sapiens. We Lutherans have a reputation for having a strong sense of the danger 
of sin. So as you might expect, it is a fairly countercultural thing to have. It's what makes us odd. It's what makes us maybe even a little weird. We are knowing of our sin. Martin Luther used to say when referring to baptism that we are to daily drown and die to sin and daily rise as a new person of God in Christ Jesus. That we are to daily die and drown in our sin and to become a new person of God in Christ Jesus. So baptism signifies our death and then our resurrection to sin. And we are reminded that we are not drowning. Instead, we already have drowned. We already have drowned in the sin. So the most healing form of prayer for me, the most healing form of meditation, at least for me, is to simply rest in the grace of knowing that I have been baptized. That I have been baptized in Christ. And then to recite perhaps this short prayer from the Orthodox tradition called the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Christians sin. Christians harm themselves and others with their selfishness, with their cookies with their guns, with their words. We harm ourselves and we harm others and certainly our relationships with God and with one another. Christians do pretty much everything that non-Christians do, good and bad, with the possible exception of belonging to a church. So the Lord Jesus Christ comes to us and stirs our soul, troubles our soul with this knowledge of our sin. The Lord troubles our soul when we let things stand that should not be. The Lord troubles our soul when we live with too much pride. The Lord troubles our soul when we raise our voices in anger. The Lord troubles our soul with a word or with a sign so that we are knowing of our sin. The Lord troubles our souls, stirs our souls, not to make us live in our sin, but to help us become whole, so that we might die to our sin and raise to this new life in Christ Jesus. That's what I think Jesus is saying in the Gospel lesson. Pay attention to your soul. You need to pay attention to your soul. Jesus is really asking us in these words, how is your soul today? How is your soul? That's where it all begins in the soul. We open our hearts and we invite God to search us and to know us and to trouble us and then to heal us. Sin is anything that separates us from God and from each other. But did you notice how the psalmist begins his words today? The psalmist says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord, most my soul longs. Indeed, my soul faints for the courts of the Lord. How lovely is your dwelling place. It is a place of such beauty and power that there is this feeling that something is akin to physical pain when we are separated from it. So yes, our hearts and our souls are longing, even fainting, with this desire to be with each other in loving relationships and certainly to be with God in a loving relationship. My soul is longing for this. My soul is fainting for this. How is your soul? Amen. We'll stand and confess our faith.
and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We the Lord. Let us give our thanks and praise to God. To give our thanks and praise. Holy God, you alone are holy and you alone are God. We give you thanks for your dear Son at the heart and the soul of human life. Near to those who suffer beside the sinner, among the poor, and with us now. And so we remember together in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant, and my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, lead us into your kingdom and teach us always to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the gifts of His body and blood strength and keep and unite us now and forever. Amen. Our hands of prayer again. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the blessings of this table. May our lives and our souls be made new by these gifts of grace, and may your love be made known through us. Amen. Now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with favor always and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll sing our closing song entitled Stronger. 